what I'm going to start by saying is, although we did not talk to each other, the presenters, in terms of what we are going to say, it seems like what I'm going to say is really following very well of what they have said, and some of that might be even repetition. So perhaps repetition might be good in some cases. Uh, I'm going to present the topic in collaboration with uh, Fratz Sayan. Fratz Sayan is sitting there. He is the PhD candidate. And he, we started this project together. And as we progressed on the project, it just became more apparent that there were other issues that he was interested in. And now he's working on immigrants with disabilities. And he has a poster at the back, so you might want to discuss that with him as well. And if you have questions, most probably I will be also referring the questions to Fred. I'm going to refer to some of the studies so that we can have a context of what the issues are. In terms of people with disabilities, the, there's quite a bit of literature that is showing that they are less likely to be employed. And then there's always this debate, well, perhaps they might not be interested in work. And that is not true at all. Studies are showing time over time that persons with disabilities have similar interests in working and in job preferences, such as full-time, part-time job preferences, as those without disabilities. So there's really no difference. And Research is also quite clear in terms of there are some barriers in the workplace, and it's really difficult to secure as well as keep employment. These are other studies. So uh, I have at the bottom of each item, I've listed the publications. These publications are available as reference at the end, and you can download and take a look at those. Of course, under copyright rules, whatever the copyright rules of your institution is following. I'm going to give you some highlights from Canadian Survey on, on Disabilities. And this is uh, 2012 data. And the first thing that we're going to see is Canadians with disabilities are 14% of the adult population. Here we are. And then I am showing you some percentages. Actually, Frat prepared these for me. And what I'm going to show you is there's the old workers. And we, I just want to highlight people with disabilities and, people, uh, and then people without disabilities. When we look at people with disabilities, we're seeing that 34% are employed, and then 5% are unemployed, and then about 61% are not in the labor force. This is according to CSD, Canadian Survey on Disability, the responses coming from individuals. And if you compare these percentages, it's very clear. We don't have to get into the details of the numbers. There seems to be uh, lesser employment opportunities for persons with disabilities. Then when we look at the type of employment, and these are among those who are employed, persons with disabilities who are employed. 80% of them are working as employees, 19% are self-employed, and 1% happens to be working in family businesses without pay. Uh, we might forget the percentages, but that's fine. The, the story over here is that in terms of their work interests, it's the same as those individuals without disabilities. But when it comes to employment, they seem to have lesser opportunities, which is not really surprising for many of you in the audience. Again, giving some of the highlights, it's 75%. Uh, if they are working, they are working full-time, 75%, 24% part-time, and 1% did not state. And in terms of permanent job, it's 87% are in permanent jobs. The percentages in terms of part-time and full-time, it seems like there is a slightly higher percentage of employees with disabilities working part-time, slightly higher than the overall employee population. 
then we can, one can say, well, maybe there's the legislation, is the legislation helping, and so on. I'm not going to get into all those details of the laws we have already covered. There are some laws over here that I have mentioned, but what I really would like to say in particular is that we should be making a business case for recruiting and retaining workers. So the business case over here is that we have to keep in mind that if there is an employee who's out uh, on a disability, if they are employed and uh, they have quicker return to the employment, and once they return, they have quicker return to productivity. So they are as productive as any others. So there are some perhaps misconceptions out there and they have reduced work delays. And we can also talk about the employee morale, not only the individuals who uh, have some type of uh, disability due to work, but also employee morale in terms of the peers and other employees, the employee morale increases. And then they also retain their skills and employers retain their skilled workers. So there should not be really a misconception, misconception that they are not skilled. They are skilled employees and they do contribute a lot to the workplace. Then uh, we come back to the Canadian survey of disability so that we can perhaps give some percentages. And this is of all employed persons with disabilities. They were asked uh, for, the, the, the question was, uh, is there workplace accommodation? And 70% said that when they asked for workplace accommodation, they received positive response, but 30% did not. So what were the responses of the employers? So we're talking about the employer responses. Uh, employers said that, well, either the employer, meaning the highest level, or the supervisor at the lower level, they refused request. Some of them said that, well, this is on the waiting list, so you just put it into the list, and hopefully it will be resolved sometime. And then some of them said that it's too expensive, we can't really do an accommodation for you. It was, well, we have to, um, it's an expense because we have to perhaps buy an equipment and maintenance of it, it's expensive. And then this is again Canadian Survey on Disability 2012 data. Of all, all those people who are employed, persons with disabilities, who needed workplace accommodations. The percentage here is 63% did not ask for accommodation. They did not, 63% did not ask for accommodation. And then the survey gives a number of reasons. They can choose the reasons of why they did not ask for recommendations, uh, accommodations. And I, I'm listing only the major ones. There was quite a bit of list. But 32% uh, about a third of them said that while well, they felt uncomfortable asking. About similar percentage, about a third, they said they have a fear of negative outcomes. Maybe it's better not to ask is what they were saying. And then some of them did not want to disclose their disability. And they were, some of them again, they were concerned about the reaction of their coworkers. And, and then again, similar percentage, they said that employer lacked awareness understanding with respect to accommodation requests. So in a way, there is really no point. The employer does not understand what I'm asking. From this point on, then I'm going to look at a study. This is a study that's conducted by Cornell University, Industrial and Labor Relations uh, Department. This is available. This, at the end, there is a link. And this is available as a YouTube video. It's an hour. Uh, presentation, so if you are interested, then you can look at it. They did a study, this is US study, perhaps there might be studies in Canada that I wasn't aware of, and uh, this, it was asking about why there are barriers in the workplace. And the first thing that comes up is employer workplace attitudes. So it's the attitudes that we're talking of, and the previous speakers also mentioned that. And the attitudes are generally really subtle. Well, they don't really respond, they don't say much, they don't really 
they just say, well, we'll, we'll think about this, and, and this means the attitudes are not necessarily accommodating. The workplace climate, inclusion and exclusion, was one of the other reasons. And what this is re really saying is that the, the barriers are not necessarily physical barriers, whether there's a step over here so I can st step over that and look and can see you, but it's really the climate itself. Is the climate uh, including everyone, and is the climate focusing on ability of individuals, skills of individuals, rather than whether they have a disability or not. That's, that's the climate that we should be looking at, is what they were saying, and they were seeing quite a bit of workplaces where there was exclusion. People were immediately seeing not the person and the skills and the contributions that this person can give to this workplace, but maybe the physical appearance of this person, or disability in this case. And then there was, uh, again, in terms of barriers in workplaces, the survey respondents said that, well, there are disability factors. And the disability factors, what it shows is that if the individuals with cognitive, neurological, or mental, emotional disability, they tend to have uh, difficulty finding a job compared to pers another person who might have physical disability. And then there was another issue related to disability factor that might be important, and that's the onset of disability while working. So if the person was employed, if the person is employed, and then while they were employed, perhaps there was an injury or illness, the individual becomes disabled. This person with the disability, if they want to come back, there's a higher opportunity for them to come back because it happened in the workplace, and it's not accommodation that we're talking of. It's the supervisor manager knows this. Uh, it wasn't included here, but I know another study, and that is perhaps, for example, depression. If the supervisor knows, and the person was working before and doing fine, after taking a break, if the person is coming back, the supervisor, this is the immediate supervisor, is, is much more inclined to include this person in the workplace, making the accommodation. The, the accommodation in this case could be simply saying, well, you are doing well, you're going to do well anyway. So nothing has changed. Come back and you're going to contribute a lot to us. So that was one of the examples that I'm giving to you. And I'm going to end with some questions. And the questions is perhaps we can all ask ourselves, what can employers do better? particularly line managers. So the, when the CEOs are very important, but the, is, if the information is trickling down to line managers, what would you recommend for line managers to do? Perhaps how it should be trickling down? How can we change the attitudes? What can we do better? Well, there are laws. Are laws enough? I don't really, I'm personally, I can respond to that, but I'm not going to say. Uh, but what can be done for compliance, or do we really need the laws? Or, or is our laws the answer to questions? Perhaps there could be other answers to those questions. So I'm going to leave it with that, and, and I hope I have challenged some of you in your thinking, and you're disagreeing with me, which would be great, so that we can have the discussion.